Hello, uh, ENV 4003, Environmental Policy 1 students. Uh, Dr. Conway here. Um, obviously, we didn't have a lecture this week because of Thanksgiving, but because the term is uh, quite a bit shorter now, because we have a week eight break, um, I don't like to miss entire lectures. Last time we did lectures five and six. Today, I want to do a little video for you on lecture seven. We will not return to this lecture. Um, so make sure you review the slides yourself and view this uh, video uh, completely. Um, when we get back, we'll be dealing with lesson eight and, and so forth as we go along. Okay, so uh, lecture, uh, lecture seven was uh, uh, about international environmental agreements, a very important subject matter uh, for a country like Canada that has so much land mass uh, as an international trading country, a heavily uh, a trading based economy, and so on. So international environmental agreements uh, are particularly important for a country like Canada. Um, we talked a lot about in previous lectures about the emergence of bilateral and multilateral problems as, a, as environmental problems move from local to regional to regional transnational and then to global. Uh, we went through that quite a bit in the history of these uh, these uh, environmental problems as they've evolved. And now many of our major environmental problems are, of course, uh, uh, transnational, international, global in scope. And so to, uh, to, to not be engaged in environmental policy or to not have knowledge of it in this day and age is, is, a, is a significant gap for anybody uh, focusing on in environmental policy. All right. And we know what the issues are, right? We know that initial local problems were local water pollution, local air type issues, local wildlife issues, local conservation issues to all of a sudden becoming regional uh, because of, uh, because of uh, river systems, because of large bodies of water like the Great Lakes and so on. And then we move to, uh, to uh, international issues uh, that were bilateral or maybe multilateral, things like acid rain, and stuff like that to, to global issues, which are global biodiversity, uh, global chemical intensification, lar long range transport of chemicals, climate change and so forth, which uh, lend themselves to uh, the, the only response being a some kind of a, a bilateral or multilateral environmental agreement. And this process of coming to grips with this started as early as 1972 with the Conference on the Human Environment, which is the first sort of major recognition by most governments in the world that the environmental policy community had largely become a global policy community. That we, if we were to respond to major challenges, both environmental problems and to broader issues of sustainable development, we needed to focus on, um, uh, on the human environment, written more broadly. And that's where the 1972 conference on uh, on the human environment, slide four, in this week's slides came to came to fruition. Okay, and these issues um, have just sort of expanded since then, um, where we now have literally dozens of various forms of international agreements that impact upon the environment and 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 human health. Uh, and so, uh, you know, some knowledge of the key ones is obviously critical, but also some knowledge of the process and how these are developed is very important for an environmental policy expert. OK. Um, and understanding the UN system, we have the United Nations Environment Program that largely shepherds most of the international agreements, but not all of them. We also have the International Labor Organization, the World Health Organization um, and and and. Uh, uh, the uh, agricultural organizations and so on that have an impact on on a lot of environmental agreements as well, but most of the most of the major ones are shepherded through the system by uh, United Nations Environment Program. Okay, and uh, having worked with the UNEP on Retainer for some eighteen years, uh, it's it's a small organization, but it it needs to have its hands in uh, a lot of pots, and and it does do that. Um, is it perfect? Of course not. Um, uh, UNEP is an agency of the UN. It's not a full UN organization. So it, it's a junior uh, partner, but it's a similar problem that you find in a lot of countries where the environment agency can be a junior agency 
to more powerful agencies. And we discussed that in terms of the evolution of the history of Environment Canada uh, in our country, okay? The next major milestone that, that kind of shaped the the way that international dialogue uh, was would was uh, uh, being set and the and and set the the agenda for how countries would talk about objectives and how they would prioritize objectives collective objectives with all the countries came out with our common future in 1987. Okay, the World Commission on Environment and Development, which issued the report Our Common Future in 1987. And this report was the first systematic articulation of the concept of sustainable development. Okay, and SD became the basis for a major review of all international environmental activities in the United Nations through the United Nations Conference on Environment Development, UNSAID, held in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, uh, during that period, we wrote a number of the background papers uh, for, for the Canadian delegation, in, including our initial thought starter paper. Um, that, that was my group at the time. Uh, th things have evolved a lot since then, obviously. 1992, uh, in the world of the fast moving world of today, uh, has, has, and the world has changed a lot since then. But UNSAID articulated an ambitious, uh, uh, United Nations uh, articulated an ambitious program of sustainable development contained in Agenda 21, which was in a negotiated document. And so everybody should Google Agenda 21 and just look at you know, the world getting together and trying to agree on something as broad framed as Agenda 21. It's important for everybody to look up Aung said Agenda 21. Um, the United Nations Conference on Environment Development Agenda 21 and familiarize yourself with all the things that the world thought it was trying to come to grips with as, as early as, as the 1992 or the early in the 1990s, okay? Uh, <clears throat> And the, the Rio Conference, uh, Aung said Rio Conference, established the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development, the Global Environment Facility in Washington, which is a, which is a major uh, organi organization, which is a trust fund of the World Bank, which supports developing countries and implementing many of the global environmental agreements. Um, I advised uh, the uh, Global Environment Facility for a number of years with respect to strategic planning and to design of financial instruments. And it can, it's, a, it's a very um, uh, complicated set of circumstances because, of course, financing the implementation of global environmental agreements, particularly for developing countries, with developed countries providing money to Jeff and through many other mechanisms to support developing countries in the implementation of, an, of, of, uh, of international commitments in the form of multilateral environmental agreements is obviously a hotly political uh, set of issues and it can get quite complicated. So, you know, Google Global Environment Facility and just inform yourself of uh, what, can, what goes on there, what scope of activities that they're involved with, okay? Um, the first framework convention on climate change was in UNCSED. The first uh, biological diversity convention was in UNCSED, okay? And so uh, that came, that, that sort of carried forward a lot of momentum for multilateral environmental agreements, but including ones that were already in place, uh, like the Basel Convention on the Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste, I believe from 84. Um, and so some, some agreements were already in place, but Agenda 21 set out a, a, a much broader uh, agenda, if you will, for multilateral environmental cooperation. So familiarize yourself with Agenda 21. Familiarize yourself with our common future, the Brundtland Report, uh, with UNCSED in, in Rio, and uh, with the Global Environment Facility. By Googling these things, I don't expect you to become an expert, but Google them, look through, and try to learn uh, what they are, where they are, and so forth, okay? Uh, but, you know, since, since Aung said and since Basel before that, there's been a lot of developments in terms of multilateral environmental agreements. Of course, several successive negotiations on climate change, but also came along the Montreal Protocol for on ozone depleting substances, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, the 
uh, the, uh, the, the international agreements on mercury and so on and so forth. There's lots of them, okay? But there's also been an, a number of other uh, multilateral negotiations that have taken place that haven't produced, uh, you know, firm um, uh, hard law agreements or mandatory agreements, but have produced instead soft law agreements and understandings and consensus. A lot of those occur that can occur at the OECD with respect to chemicals, but they can occur in, in other venues as well. Um, uh, for example, the strategic approach to international chemicals management, uh, where I was an advisor to the secretariat there, was a soft law agreement, okay? So we can think of two categories. Hard law agreements are known as legally binding on states that ratify the agreement. Soft law agreements are thought as voluntary or aspirational. Examples of hard law agreements, the Basel Convention, the Montreal Protocol, the Stockholm Convention. Examples of soft law agreements would be SICAM, would be Agenda 21, um, would be these types of sort of aspirational um, and voluntary consensus type documents. Okay, and, uh, the, the soft law agreements, when you come back, the government, if the government signs on to a soft law agreement, it brings it home and it, and it commits itself to try to aspire towards these goals that have been set out in the voluntary framework. Hard law agreements actually need to be brought back to the country, ratified by parliament, and they need to be actually, in order to implement hard law agreements, often new regulations have to be developed, okay, if they're not already in place. For example, um, the case of the Stockholm Convention, when Canada went out to, to have a leading role in negotiation of that, when we brought it back, we didn't have to make all that many changes to our regulatory infrastructure because um, we, had, we had already basically banned most of those compounds. But other countries would have to bring those home, ratify and develop the entire regulatory regime to bring a reality at the national level for the hard law agreement. Okay, So the ratification process is, 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 is much more, uh, is longer and more legal. Base, it has a more legal basis than you would find in soft law agreements, okay? And that's covered off in, in slide eight, so make sure you understand the difference between hard law and soft law agreements, okay? <clears throat> and we, of course we have uh, different institutions that are involved depending upon the nature of the agreement that's being, that's being sought, okay? Um, for example, if it's on pesticides, an agreement might be reached through the Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome. If it's, if it's clearly on a, in a more general environmental field, it might be led by UNEP. Okay? If it's, if it's uh, chemicals and public health, chemicals and worker health, it might be the WHO or the ILO, the International Labor Organization or the World Health Organization. Okay, so it depends. And so a complex network of institutions has been set up internationally to, to shepherd a lot of the multilateral environmental agreements. And there are many, okay, uh, from shipping to, to, to food to pesticides to industrial chemicals. Uh, there are lots of different agreements out there. Um, you might want to you know, Google UNEP, International Environmental Agreements or Multilateral Environmental Agreements, and find a list and familiarize yourself with the, the, the scope of, of the types of environmental agreements that are out there, okay? Um, and some of them, if it's, a, if it's a, the comprehensive list that I'm aware exists, you'll also see ILO agreements on there that impact about environmental worker health and safety, for which um, uh, you will cover off, we will cover off in the second term. Um, you have you know, a number of different agreements that are either food-based, worker-based, chemical-based, climate-based, uh, invasive species, uh, particular compounds like mercury. Uh, there's a number of different agreements out there. So Google uh, UNEP a list of environmental agreements and, and fish around with wording like that, and you can find a comprehensive list of these uh, international environmental agreements, okay? And just like in, in, uh, in, in domestic law, uh, many of the international environmental agreements are designed by core principles and practices. Uh, you will find if you go into, for example, pull down the Stockholm Convention on, on, sound, on persistent organic pollutants and, and just go through the exercise that, I, that, 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 you know, um, that I've asked you to do with respect to legislation in, in, uh, in lectures five and six.
go through and find some of the key principles and concepts and understand how these international agreements are organized. Um, and, and you'll find concepts like prevention. We already know pollution prevention. We covered that, okay? You'll find a unique uh, principle of subsidiarity. The linkages between individuals and the global consequences of their actions are a major challenge, and, and most of the implementation should be as close to the source of the problem as possible. So we, 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 we call this the principle of subsidiarity, uh, which calls for decision-making and accountability to fall to the lowest level of government or political organization that can effecti effectively take action with the scope of the problem, okay? So uh, these are the types of concepts. Those are covered off in 10, uh, 10 and 11, okay? Um, we have common but differentiated responsibility is another key concept that's out there. Uh, that that we we can we can refer to and that that deals with the, the issue of the fact that a lot of the heavily the countries that have been heavily industrialized fully developed economically um, like Canada United States the European Union and so forth uh, have a have a differentiated responsibility with respect to global environmental problems because our early industrialization created a lot of them things like climate change things like chemical intensification of the global economy and so on. And so uh, built into most of these environmental, international environmental agreements or multilateral environmental agreements is the assumption that everybody has responsible for the problem, but uh, the wealthier countries who have been industrialized for longer periods of time or higher per capita consumers of natural resources, highest per capita emitters of, of greenhouse gases, and so on. Uh, these the, They have a, a differentiated responsibility, which is more uh, more, um, I'll, how should I say, weighty relative to what we, uh, we would expect out of many developing countries. Now, with the BRICS coming on, the Chinas, the Brazils, the Indias, and so on, uh, that equation is eventually going to change as these other countries become wealthier. Uh, their responsibility to act on their own uh, it, with, on environmental problems, in addition to the actions that they'll take with funding support or technical support from the developed countries, their responsibility to act on their own is becoming more um, substantial. And most of the official development assistance and environmental assistance now globally is going to the, L uh, the least developed countries, what we call the LDCs, okay? Uh, because we have to, most multilateral environmental agreements rely on consensus decision-making um, because these international processes can't force countries to comply. There has to be quite elaborate uh, negotiation and buy-in, including buy-in assuming the promise of developed country financial support. So openness is a concept that you'll see uh, in there a lot. Openness, transparency, engagement, negotiation, those kind of language, that, those kind of, uh, of, of uh, definitions and uh, processes will be reflected in a lot of multilateral environmental agreements. But again, pull one or two of them down and do a quick scan so you familiarize yourself with these things, okay? Also, you'll find polluter pays principle in a lot of them as well. Uh, we know about polluter pays. We covered it off in the domestic context as well, okay? Precautionary approach will be there uh, in a lot of these international environmental agreements as well. Um, now, obviously, if, if we lived in a perfect world, multilateral environmental agreements would be negotiated. Everybody would sign them. They would take them home. They would ratify them in their own uh, decision-making bodies, some elected, some not. Uh, they would uh, fully implement them through law and regulation. But in reality, of course, our, you know, the country's capacity, the, the capacity of various countries at different levels of economic development very widely in terms of their capacity to actually implement these things. So we have what we call the implementation gap in multilateral environmental agreements uh, where, uh, you know, we can have these agreements and sometimes they're, they're not adequately implemented. Most cases, developed countries will implement them, uh, but uh, developing countries may struggle because of financial and technical capacity or regional conflict or or, or other kinds of disasters present them be, from taking a systematic approach to implementation of these things. But that's, that's just a, that's, it's an overview, a generalization, because in some areas, for example, in the Paris Agreement on climate change, developed countries are the ones that are also not 
carrying the can in terms of implementation. So it will vary across the agreements, okay? But there is often an implementation gap that we try to deal with. In fact, the strategic approach to international chemicals management, the one I told you about earlier, uh, a major motivator from that for that was to try to close the gap on implementation uh, of chemicals management between developed and developing countries, okay? So familiarize yourself with that. We call that the implementation gap, and it can be, it can be more severe with some agreements than with others, okay? Um, also, pull down the Basel Convention. It was one of the earlier multilateral environmental agreements. Canada was very active in that. Montreal Protocol, Canada was very active in that. And the financial mechanism for Montreal Protocol was very effective. Um, and it had its own separate uh, financial mechanism in addition to the global environment facility one that I told you about attached to the World Bank in Washington, okay? Uh, and the Montreal Protocol uh, received quite a bit of funding to help develop developing countries with the implementation and it became an example of quite an effective multilateral environmental agreement, okay? And there's some good short histories out there on these things that you can find on Google just to explain why did that one get so much attention? Why was it so important? Well, because of the drastic nature and the costs of what would happen if we, we had huge holes in the ozone layer, obviously. And will we get to that point with climate change? Who knows, right? I mean, it may take longer. Uh, that you know, there's two schools of thought: one that thinks we can act now, the other that thinks that we might not be we, we might not be able to act effectively until major disasters happen. It will be interesting to see uh, what will go on with climate change. With chemicals, most of the international agreements have dealt with specific range of chemicals: persistent organic pollutants, hazardous waste, mercury. But we all know that chemicals, chemical intensification of the global economy and its impacts is much broader than that and very difficult for national regimes to get a hold of those, or let, or let alone, uh, or to manage that, let alone multilateral environmental agreements with all the countries in the world, okay? <clears throat> so, well, developing countries, you know, they, they come in, they negotiate, they sign on, they're encouraged by the financial support. Their capacity to fully implement is still emerging. Um, in, in some of the, the more rapidly developing developing countries, of course, their capacities to respond to multilateral environment agreements go up, but also so does with the increased uh, economy, economic activity, the desire of the consumers to live like people do in developed countries, and so on. They're also generating more environmental problems. For example, we see that with climate change. China, India, Brazil, Nigeria, and so on, heavy contributors to climate change. So each individual issue has to, uh, in each individual multilateral environmental agreement, has to be considered on its own merits to see uh, how it's being implemented, why it emphasized what it emphasized when it was developed, and so on. So pull down uh, one or two of the agreements, do the searches on, on the early young said and the, the Brundtland report, and a few other things. Many of you will already know about those, but pull them down and familiarize yourself with these issues. Um, these, these issues will come up in the final exam, okay? Multilateral environmental agreements are particularly important, as I said, for a country like Canada. So familiarize yourself, do some of that Googling, uh, make yourself aware of what's going on out there with multilateral environmental agreements, all right? So on that note, I'll let you go for this week. We'll see you in... Two weeks time, I guess, after week eight. Enjoy your week eight break, and we'll see you in uh, week nine. Okay, take care now. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.